Hi, I'm Paul Drzajic. I'm with the MRS Bulletin. I'm here with Professor Steve Forrest, the University of Michigan. Steve has, uh, uh, you've done a number of really interesting things. Uh, it's distinguished academic career, but also an entrepreneurship and then advising big companies. And since the focus today is on uh, research and industry, let's focus on that. So um, just your impressions of the meeting, what hot topics do you, uh, are you seeing in this week that are relevant to uh, indus industry? Well, since the meeting is just beginning, I, I can't really speak fully to that, but I can tell you that there are some really major materials challenges out there. I think we're facing, of course, the end of Moore's Law. So figuring out how to make materials that can do more than silicon, but as cheaply as silicon, is a very big issue. I think there's lots of things to be done in the medical fields and of course my own field in the uh, session that I was in today is in organic light emitting devices and <clears throat> as we look forward we're very interested in making low cost highly efficient light sources using organic materials. Uh, the reason for that is <clears throat> the materials are green and the uh, interest in having efficient light sources uh, is huge because of the energy saving potential of, of that technology. So, uh, you know, when we look at the world today, um, the Googles, the Facebooks and everything else, they all depend on materials and materials innovation, making electrons go from A to B faster, more efficiently, uh, with more functionality. And if we want to keep the productivity of the electronics industry and the world that we live in moving forward. Um, it's all going to start with materials and m much of that is discussed here. Sure. <clears throat> I'm uh, struck by the diversity of topics you talked on. So you've got semiconductors, which are, you were saying are near inflection point, but a huge established industry. Uh, flat panel displays, OLEDs are, you know, I mean, flat panels are also established, but OLEDs are pretty new. So again, they're still still up and coming. And then the whole bioscience area is just really, uh, really interesting. So from a material science research perspective, for companies, you've got sort of innovation, people in the lab making products. Uh, you've got applied research, which is really pushing towards the products, and basic research, which is the underpinning of all of this. So maybe you spend a few minutes, your perspective on the importance of applied and basic research and feeding that innovation pipeline. I look at applied and basic research as sort of like putting, uh, taking money out and putting money into a bank. So if you think about basic research, it's creating new knowledge. That's like investing. It's putting money into the bank. And applied research is, like, is, is similar to taking those innovations and those ideas out of that bank and making something that's practical and has value to the average human. Like any banking system, you can't do one all by itself for too long. Sure. You have to have a balance. I'm afraid in this country that industry is almost entirely focused on applied research. And this is a, a new uh, phenomenon, you know, the collapse basically of Bell Laboratories and the, the large industrial laboratory systems that we had in the post-war era has really left a void. Universities, academia uh, have um, attempted and to, and to some extent have shown success in filling that void. But we do not have the totally functional innovation ecosystem that we really need um, into the future. And so I think that industry really has to reach out to academia and actually academia has a lot of work to do to reach out to industry to make sure that we have those two pieces in balance um, because this is really the source of our future. Mm. Um, now, of course, the critics would say that companies will invest in basic research if it impacts their bottom line and that just doesn't seem to be a popular perspective these days. So how do you overcome that viewpoint? I think by partnerships because I don't think you're going to change the need to give return to shareholders that's what companies are there to do, mm -hmm. right? Your, your shareholders are your investors. Your investors expect return. 
they cannot look 20, 30 years in the future. They don't have that sort of patience. That's not how our economic system is set up. So you need to really have partnerships. It's the only way you can do it. And I think we're, you know, since I, I would say 1980, things have progressively gotten better. 1980 was really a, a dividing line in our history because it was the year that the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, which mm -hmm. allowed universities to commercialize uh, innovations that were developed under federal funding. And so this changed the dynamic very fundamentally in, at universities that there was a place for applied research, but there was also a place for basic research. Companies, on the other hand, have gone in the other direction, as I've just mentioned. They've gotten more and more applied because they're, they're trying to satisfy their shareholders, but also, you know, things like Moore's Law, which I talked about initially, is such a driving force that if you fall off that wagon, you're going to, you won't exist tomorrow. So you have to pay attention. You have to be focused like never before. So I think it's the partnership that works. And that will allow companies to continue to innovate. It will allow university research to continue to be even more relevant. Mm. Yeah, so by Dole, that's a very uh, U.S. perspective, but co companies these days are multinational. So do you yes. see much geographic difference in approach, either in Pacific Rim or Europe or other places across the world? Yes. Um, I'm actually fairly lucky. I've, um, I have many um, associations abroad with universities, some of them very deep, um, also with companies uh, across the world. And America stands alone in its ability to innovate and drive innovation to something that's real for people. There's only one other, and I, I probably will get myself into some trouble here, but I think there's only one other country that comes close to the U.S. in its innovation power, and that's Israel. Hmm. For many of the same reasons, that, and some very different reasons, um, that America is powerful in this, but it has to do with diversity and legal systems and, and a whole bunch of uh, demographic issues that allow these two countries to innovate. Um, other regions of the world have struggled. Um, and it's, uh, but nevertheless, every advanced country that is one with an advanced economy um, understands the necessity to be innovative. So they are starting to develop legal systems and, or, or legal constructs mm. that make mm. it more beneficial for people to invent and to make use of their inventions into the future. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's clearly a trend. So we're at a Materials Research Society meeting and we're talking about uh, research in more in a general way. Yes. So let's look specifically at material science and engineering. What's the overall role of this subdivision to the degree you can even define what material science and research is in, in the innovation pipeline? Well, I can't define what material science is, except that it is the one thing I know for sure, because it's very broad. The one thing I know for sure, it's at the, it is at the literal foundation of every major innovation that has emerged in the 20th and the 21st century and probably the 19th. New materials bring new technologies. New technologies bring new products and solutions to people. And if we don't start with materials, we have nowhere to go. So it was exactly what I talked about at the beginning of this, that we have this f fantastic world of creativity that comes out of companies like Google and eBay and Facebook and you name it, but they all depend on materials advances and the internet. All of that is completely dependent on advances and its continued progress and its growth will depend on what people in this meeting and in the materials field in general will be up to in the next decades. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's, that's a very true answer. One 
thing that strikes me as interesting is that from a public perception, I don't think material science quite has the same sort of easy recognition as physics or chemistry or biology. And in fact, even students coming up through undergrads, there's aren't a lot, uh, the material science departments aren't as established for, as an undergraduate major for graduate school. So how do we improve like the, the visibility and the public's perception of, uh, of material science? That is a very difficult question. And that's a problem that I have had to grapple with uh, throughout my career because I've always been associated with material science departments. I have a joint department appointment in material science at, at the University of Michigan when I was at Princeton. I was part of the, material, uh, the Princeton Materials Institute and so on. Um, the materials though underlines everything. Uh, it underlies biology, it underlies physics, of course chemistry is essentially a materials field. Um, how do you get students to gravitate directly toward innovation in new materials. That's a very difficult problem. I think one of the problems that material science faces is that whereas physics you can very easily lay out what, is the, what, is, what are the foundations of this field? Electricity and magnetism, quantum mechanics, um, optics, and so on. With materials, material scientists disagree on what is the foundation of the field, what is the, the basic knowledge that we have to impart to our students. I believe that ambivalence is inherent in the field because the field is broad, it's, it's wide ranging. Um, it extends from the Iron Age to the semiconductor age. So it's a problem that has remained unresolved throughout my career. I started as a professor in 1985 also in material science at the University of Southern California. Um, and I don't see it resolving itself in my lifetime, but I, I'm not sure that matters. But I am concerned, Paul, in what you say about attracting students. Mm -hmm. And I think when they see the excitement of real widgets in their hands and somebody explains to them how it works and that how it works is based on a materials innovation. For example, my field is organic LEDs. You pull out an, uh, an I, uh, a smartphone with an organic LED in it and you tell them this came because of these innovations. That excites students. You tell students materials are going to be the answer to renewable energy. That excites them. So I think we have to do it in a fairly indirect way. It's not like physics or, or chemistry. But I have to tell you in academia um, those fields are struggling too to attract the right students, you know, students who are really excited about just the fundamental fields too. So I don't think it's peculiar to materials, but I agree that materials has a specific, has a particular um, difficulty mm -hmm. in, in articulating what it's all about. Yeah. So um, do you have an elevator pitch used with students? I want, uh, actually, that, that's a tough one. Um, I think my, my, what I'm looking for is what the student's elevator pitch is to me. Ah. What excites them? And then I can tell them how they can direct that into the various fields that they're interested in. Um, students are, are much more removed today from the actual operation of how things work than they were, I think, when you and I were growing up. Mm. You know, a car was not a mystery of electronic modules. It was something you could open the hood and fix the carburetor. Um, your television, you pulled out the tubes, right? Today, everything is modulized. So the students of today do not see these materials innovation in the hands-on, personal way that our earlier generations were able to do that. So you have to see what really excites them and try to try to encourage them. I I can tell you I have no problem finding good students. Okay. You know I have no problem finding good students. Several of them come to. By the way, um, the Materials Research Society is a place where my past students, who are now professors or professionals, and my current students all show up. And so it's a it's like a homecoming to us. Uh, so I've got students that go back, well, a long time who 
have been dedic have dedicated their lives to innovating in new materials, and they do use, you know, not to give a bald advertisement, but they the Materials Research Society is where they come. Okay, well that's great. So uh, Professor Steve Forrest, thanks for your time. It's my pleasure, Paul. Okay. Thank you.